live specifications from requirements to automated tests and back with Paul Gerard. My name is Dara. I'll be your, we your webinar moderator today. Before I hand you over to Paul Gerard, I'd like to bring a few things to your attention. Paul will present for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A session directly after. If you have a question for Paul, just type it into the questions field in the control panel, and I will address the questions to Paul at the end of the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and emailed to you when it is available. As for the slides, we'll email the slides to you, as well as place them in the Eurostar blog. Feel free to join the conversation on Twitter during the webinar and after the webinar, and you can use our, our hashtag ESCONFS. You can also find today's presenter, uh, Paul Gerard at at Paul underscore Gerard. And now, without further delay, I would like to welcome Paul as today's webinar presenter. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon. Morning. <laughs> Okay, um, this is a talk that follows on from the session I run at Eurostar, which was, uh, oh sorry, I need to show my screen, don't I? Uh, this, this talk is a follow-on from uh, what I gave at, at Eurostar, and is kind of the next natural step in the thinking uh, of a series of um, ideas which I'm pulling together from uh, the agile world, but also our background in structured waterfall, uh, you know, traditional projects, if that's what if that's uh, the way you look at things. Um, in, in terms of live specs from requirements to automated tests and back, is I want to tell you a story, in effect, uh, of the uh, move from traditional delivery, in effect, to uh, what's increasingly popular in the agile circles and perhaps uh, a, an evolution of agile into something called continuous delivery. Um, in part of, as part of the story, I'll describe what we call definition and assurance, if you like, requirements and testing, and bringing the two things close together. Um, I'll talk about traceability achieved in flight rather than as an afterthought, and uh, there's a promise, if we work this way, uh, of eliminating much, if not all, of manual feature checking, the basic nuts and bolts checking that testers do a lot of, because perhaps developers don't pay attention to it or, or aren't incented to pay attention to it. So uh, that's an interesting prospect. Uh, finally, I want to close with uh, some ideas on traceability and impact analysis and the benefits of having documentation which uh, evolves from dead documents to live specifications. And then I'll close. So let me talk about uh, a shift, I think, that's happening in the business, and it might be happening to you, or might have already happened to you, or it might be something that is, you know, months or even years away, uh, because every every uh, aspect of the industry is a different point in their in their journey, if you like. But uh, some of the uh, conversations that we were having at Eurostar last year uh, in 2011 were to do with the death of testing and the redistribution and so on. Um, we don't think testing is dead, of course not, but we do believe there's a shift in emphasis of where testing and testers do their job. So I want to describe that uh, fairly quickly and just give you a sense of what we think is happening out there in the marketplace. So I want to take you on a kind of a journey and, uh, and, and if you like, you know, tell a story, and that's where I tend to try and present these things, uh, as a journey from waterfall to continuous delivery. And the essence of the, the talk is really about how we move from documentation which has very little value uh, as an asset, but also as a working uh, source of knowledge, to use uh, what's being called nowadays live specifications or live specs. And the method that uh, helps with this most of all is uh, something called behavior-driven development. Um, now, because this is a webinar, I can't sort of gauge how many of you know uh, what BDD is today and uh, how agile the group that are listening to the webinar are. But uh, so, I'll, so I'll give a brief overview of these things. I'm sorry if this is already stuff you, you, you know, but I need to just put some context in place. Essentially what I'm doing is looking to bring some agile ideas into more structured traditional waterfall environments but with a pragmatic view to achieve the goals of, of our businesses. Um, and, and all in all, I'd, I'd say the testing is changing, but it's for the better. So there is a shift. I think it's been driven by the technologists, but also by businesses who use, use and acquire software 
and they want us as an industry to move into a more agile and more continuous mode of delivery. And it's a positive thing, I think, but there are changes afoot. So let me summarize the, what I think is going on out there. Um, you could say, and this is a very simplistic view, you, know, you could say that uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s we were in like a waterfall structured uh, kind of environment and the 2000s was the decade of agile and we're in 2012, almost 2013 now. And there are definite signs that uh, continuous delivery is the next evolution in, in this journey of uh, software development. Now, some people will never escape waterfall because of the nature of their businesses. So high integrity systems probably will be waterfall for all time. But a lot of organizations have dabbled with agile and some, some organizations are completely agile and they've never known any other way. But increasingly, we're seeing a move to what would be called continuous delivery, which is not, not uh, more agile, it's a completely different uh, mindset. Um, and what drives it is the ability now to use structured stories, a structured source of knowledge, structured text if you like, to generate test code to drive the development, development activity you know, with a, a test driven development kind of uh, approach. And there are several, several uh, associated approaches in this uh, kind of arena. So you'll hear we talk about specification by example, behavior driven development, test driven development, acceptance test driven development. They are all a family of approaches, all very much oriented towards defining what is required in a better way and then using that knowledge to drive the development of the software. And by so doing, we acquire a set of automated tests which we can reuse for development, but also they are candidates for aggression testing in the future. So Specification by example promotes kind of a continuous process of specification, exampling, and illustration, the test first uh, process, and also a handover to a continuous integration environment to run tests for all time. Uh, now, interestingly, I met um, a chap at Eurostar from Malaysia, and uh, he, he gave me the interesting insight, which was um, they reckon they're five years behind the West in their development methods in, in IT and their approach is that they're going to skip Agile and jump from waterfall straight into continu continuous. So it's certainly being taken very seriously over there. And, and we see it in some of our clients and some of the organizations we work with uh, that, that increasingly continuous delivery is an attractive option for our businesses. So we think this isn't for everybody but there is definitely a shift in the marketplace, an emphasis from agile to, and in some cases towards continuous delivery. And it's using this behavior driven or specification by example approach. So let me talk about these, um, this behavior BDD and continuous delivery briefly. Um, BDD is a method which is primarily about a collaborative approach to capturing requirements and a specification of the behavior of software before you deliver it. So the principle is that you capture the knowledge of the behavior of features in the software in stories in a structured language and use that language to generate test code which can then drive the test driven development approach within the development area. I mean, in theory, uh, stakeholders define the scenarios, but it's a collaborative approach primarily. Certainly stakeholders have to be aware, understand what's going on, and they do contribute. But it's a collaborative effort, that's the point. Now, what continuous testing tells you is that where you uh, implement software at, in the small using stories, and the stories and the code and the automated tests are coherent and synchronized and continuously in alignment, the automated testing using the, the, the tests that are created uh, by, by the developer or a tester continually tell you where you are. So it's a much better informed and a much better uh, feedback loop to keep you on track with what the goal of your stakeholders are. Now Dan North, who is one of the um, founders of the behavior driven uh, development community um, himself is, is moving in this direction and his you know, motto now on his website is faster software delivery from months to minutes. It's an ambitious kind of claim and, 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 and goal 
but it's now becoming possible to take on that kind of ambition, to deliver in the same day as the idea for the, for the requirement. It's not for everybody, but some aspects of our business is moving in this direction. So let me just walk through very quickly uh, behavior driven development and how it works. Um, a requirement, and, and I'll use the word requirement as a generic kind of catch-all for the knowledge uh, that defines the behavior of our software. Uh, some people define their requirements in stories, some people split requirements and stories, um, I, and that's how I think as well. So a requirement is really the re a re traditional requirement potentially with some stories that identify features and some scenarios, some business scenarios that illustrate those features in use. So let's say we've got some structured stories in a, in a language that we can understand. There are tools out there like Cucumber, uh, JBehave, Specflow, there are several tools, uh, more, more, than, more than you realize now, they're growing at quite a rate. The tool can take the structured text of a story and generate test code. So the test code are essentially some tests that uh, example the behavior of the software, but of course when you create the test code without the system under test, those tests will fail. But by generating those tests and then associating the tests with the system and a test using test fixtures, which is a develop, the developer, developer's code to connect the test to the uh, system and a test. When we run those tests through the tool, we can use the failing tests to drive the development effort. And test-driven development is essentially about this cycle of you write the test and run the test and watch it fail. You create the code to pass the test. You rerun the test and you go around that loop until all your tests pass. So the, the, at the bottom right, the, that kind of cycle is the developers doing test-driven development, but they are driven initially, at least, by these behaviors described in the stories themselves. Now, the tests that are generated by this process become candidate regression tests. Now, some organizations uh, might choose to implement them all as regression tests for all time, but potentially there's a lot more than you need in, in, in this respect for regression purposes. I would call them candidate regression tests. So there is a selection, maybe all, but as often as not, it's a selection of those tests that ultimately become regression tests and, and retained for all time. Now, the outcome of the testing done by the automation, that can be fed back to give you a status of all the stories and, that, and fed back through the requirements back to stakeholders so they know exactly the situation with respect to the features they've identified in stories. So this is a, like a positive feedback loop both for the developers who run, run the tests, who then uh, write code to pass those tests, and stakeholders who see, who have visibility of progress towards completion of their stories, in effect, the features uh, that have been uh, implemented by the developers. So it's a positive thing. Now, if we look, look uh, take the helicopter view of delivery of, uh, of whole projects, um, most organizations in the up to, to until recently, uh, have delivered in a series of phases, a structured way, waterfall if you like, where there will be a sequence of activities spanning weeks or maybe months to deliver a version of software in perhaps six months or nine months or a year or even longer timescales. Now what traditional delivery uh, does well is it allows you to be in control of uh, a project with respect to the costs and sequencing and dependencies and so on. The problem is because of the time it takes to deliver, the business might change over time and also the, the sheer ambition of some projects is so huge that the complexity of those projects becomes very uh, prohibitive. And so a lot of larger projects delivering in a, in a, in a sequenced traditional manner uh, fail because they are just over ambitious. What continuous delivery promises is to bite off chunks of functionality that are achievable in a short time. Now that short time might be as little as a day or it could be a week or a fortnight. But the principle is this, that by taking smaller steps the path to delivery is reduced in time and the certainty is increased and the risk of failure is reduced because it is simply less ambitious. So rather than do uh, one release in 100 days, the ambition might be to do 100 releases in 100 days. And each one of those releases is supported 
by the automation process that we looked at on the previous slide. So the behavior-driven approach drives the delivery of new software in terms of the stories and scenarios, fully automated testing to, to drive it. And the whole thing of the requirement, the tests, and the delivered code are in sync day by day, every day. And the other thing is, if, if you deliver 100 times in 100 days, by day 100, the software that you delivered on the first delivery, 99 days ago, has been tested and retested and retested and regression tested and has evolved over time, but continuously as, a, as an architecture, the entirety of the architecture has been uh, regression tested many, many, many times. So the, the overall reliability and coherence of the delivered software is much increased. So now that's the good news. The bad news is, of course, not every organization can work with such short time scales. And also, of course, there's a concern that, wait a minute, if we're delivering code after one day's thought, surely there's a very good chance that it completely misses the point and could cause a complete disaster in our production systems. Well, that's true. So it isn't for everybody. And I'll, I'll sp speak about that a little more shortly. But going back to the continuous delivery uh, kind of process and mentality, it's treated almost like a pipeline. You could call it a production line, uh, maybe even a, a factory process. But, but essentially, from the moment of the idea through to the tests, to the code, to the automation, and to delivery into an acceptance process, it's very strongly supported by automation. Most of the test checking is done by tools, and the user acceptance tests, exploratory testing, if you like, or end-to-end -end testing, that is what remains as a manual process. So the principle is that continuous delivery, fed by a behavior-driven development, or run like a, an engine, you know, which is the BDD uh, approach, the prospect is there is to deliver much faster between idea to implementation. That's the point. Now, this isn't uh, going to work in most organizations for obvious reasons, in that a lot of systems have to be delivered in big chunks, not small increments. So deployment into production is not necessarily the same as going live. So one, one approach can be that you might ship 100 uh, releases into a production environment, but not expose that functionality to end users until you're very ready to go live. But the benefit of that is shipping code into a production environment allows you to test in that production environment without danger to your users, as long as you know, with some uh, safeguards in place, of course. But the principle is that you could get used to having a production system supported by operation staff with uh, reliability and performance targets in place in a realistic uh, world environment before you ship into live. It's a much lower risk to ship uh, larger pieces of functionality in this way than it is to necessarily to ship, uh, to do a big bang approach, if you like. So uh, there are many ways, and the, you'll hear things like you know, dark releases and uh, hidden functionality and limited rollouts, and there are various uh, techniques for doing this kind of game. And clearly, organizations like Amazon and Google do this all the time, hundreds of th or even thousands of releases every year. That's not for everybody, of course, but that is an ambition that a lot of organizations aspire to that a lot of organizations are beginning to think that that's the way their software businesses should operate. So let's step back for a moment. Um, what I've talked about in terms of BDD and the use of uh, this pipeline to deliver functionality in a very rapid way, uh, it all sounds, it sounds like it's about production lines and automation. Well, I, I, I want to step back from that because sensibly, if you have this let's call it a machine to deliver functionality into production. If that machine is reliable, that's fantastic. But for that machine to deliver reliable, trusted functionality, there must be trusted requirements fed into that pipeline. So a lot of the continuous delivery idea depends on high quality requirements. They may be requirements of relatively low, small scope and, and small scale perhaps but they are very reliable and trusted, and that's how it would work. 
to be able to deliver three times a day into production environment and two of those releases are uh, patches to repair faults, that's not the idea. The idea is to reliably deliver useful functionality into a production environment. So my argument is that if you think of continuous delivery as a hungry beast that eats requirements, those requirements have to be trusted to the level of being well understood enough, complete and coherent enough to allow developers to build useful functionality that is reliable. So let me step back from this word perfection because uh, I need to be careful. I'm not saying that requirements have to be perfect because we will never get there. But a trusted requirement is one that is, you could take the view right here, right now, we believe it describes the functionality required by our businesses to deliver value, that we understand enough of the requirement in order to build it at a, in a time scale that is acceptable and a cost that is acceptable, and without uh, too many unknowns and uncertainties in the outcome. So a trusted requirement is one where we are confident that we can deliver and we can press the button and push requirements through our continuous delivery process in order to achieve the business value that our uh, stakeholders require. So a trusted requirement is what's, what's needed, not a perfect requirement. So with that in mind, we now have this vision of a trusted requirement feeding into a development process called baby-driven development, highly automated, certainly the testing is, is highly automated, with a very rapid uh, manual test process at the end. Now, in order to do that, it does not make sense anymore to separate the requirements activity in a project from the testing and assurance. And I would, uh, we, we, we uh, now use the terms definition and assurance to describe the slightly different behaviors that are required to manage the definition of a requirement, the definition of the need, and the assurance of delivery. You know, there's a slightly different mindset required to do this. So we've changed uh, our view on how we describe these things. We don't use the word testing quite so much because it's not testing of software so much as testing of thinking and knowledge and obviously requirements. So what BDD allows us to do is to bring the analysis activity of a project much closer to testing. Now stepping back, if you think uh, over the last 20-30 uh, years of uh, the software business, what we've ended up with in structured projects is um, longer term activities, maybe three months, six months, nine months, a year, where the requirements activity is separated from the validation of a system by three, six, nine months. Now, this makes no sense at all because it, it's, it's like um, requesting a car and not knowing until nine months later whether how you will recognize a good car. So uh, the, de the definition of requirements that says this is what I need, but I'm not going to think about how I validate that need until the software is delivered, which might be six or nine months later, at which point the need may have changed, but also um, the way I validate that might be completely differently from what I Im imagined at the moment I made the request. So if you like, what Agile has, has shown us is the, the value of rapid feedback within days or a couple of weeks in a, an iteration it's transformed the way that developers can develop software because they now get rapid feedback you know, within days or even a couple of weeks to allow them to stay on track and to deliver the software as required, not as they might imagine given some loose requirements. One of the aspects of Agile that has worked remarkably, remarkably well is this rapid feedback, this idea of fast feedback, uh, failing fast if you like. But even in Agile uh, projects, it's quite clear that if a product owner suggests uh, some, identifies some new functionality with stories and then sets the developers off to go and build these things and two weeks later it turns out the requirements actually aren't so clear after all, 
um, it's kind of not a good use of anyone's time, you know, the, certainly the, the developers, to be set a task to build something that is partly defined. In effect, what we've been doing is we've been using developers to build software that proves the requirements are poor. So it makes much more sense to, to pay more attention to the requirements up front and then to set the developers the task of building the software to meet those requirements. And the whole idea of the redistribution of testing is to bring some of the test activity that happens late to demonstrate requirements are met or not met, to bring some of that activity up front to demonstrate requirements are valid or trusted, if you like. So redistributed testing is about bringing the test activity, some of the test activity up front to meet with the analysis work and the definition. So we would call this definition and assurance. So let's just sort of step back and look at a, a very, very simplified uh, schematic of the development process. So, so here I've got um, three, three key activities. A definition of a functional requirement, then we have a build process for the developers, and some, but uh, not, let, let's call it very good testing, but traditional testing is, is typically not as good as it could be. And then we have a big test phase at the end with lots of checking and obviously uh, the incident management process and the feedback and so on. What happens? How can we show the relationship between these three phases? Well, firstly, when the software moves into testing, the testers typically find lots of problems and things that they would regard as relatively simple checks seem to fail as well as the more serious uh, integration kind of stuff. But let's just think about the checking in particular. The basic, does this feature do what the users require? When the testers raise lots of incidents and feed them back to developers, the developers have a lot of rework to do and one way of looking at the test phase is actually, it's misnamed, it is actually the rework phase. The testers generate the rework uh, and the thinking and the discussion of what is a bug and what is not a bug, but they generate the rework for the developers to complete. So you could say that developer development extends into the test phase as well. So the testing at the end finds lots of bugs, which is good. The problem is it causes lots of rework. Some of that rework is avoidable. Occasionally, the testing that happens at the end will identify failures in the requirements themselves. The requirement was badly formed, ambiguous, uh, misunderstood, incomplete, incoherent, and so on. So it's not a happy situation, and particularly when you extend these uh, requirements, build, and test phases over months, uh, the situation gets dramatically worse. And many projects are, get themselves into trouble because of this. So let me suggest an alternative. Let me suggest that we take some of the activity in the test phase and bring it forward into the requirements phase. And by so doing, we improve the quality of the requirement and the outcome of that process are some concrete examples of features in use. These are our stories and scenarios. So looking forwards, we would say, if we have better requirements and some improved uh, and some um, business scenarios and test cases fed into the behavior driven into the development process, we would expect fewer requirements failures coming from the development team. When the software is delivered into testing, because we're not doing as much checking, we're not going to find as many low-level checking bugs because those checks have been done by the developers with tools already. So there's a requirement for actually less testing, which will generate less rework in development, which is caused or driven by the slightly better requirements coming out of the requirements piece. So what we, let me, this is not to scale, of course it isn't, but I just want to walk you through the thinking behind why this could work really nicely. If we take some of the rework out of the development phase because the bugs that are that rework are captured at the moment of writing the code rather than having shipped and then reworking things later, we lose some of the effort in the development phase because the checking is not done at the end, it's done at the beginning. 
Now, because the checking is not done by the testers, we lose some of that uh, effort in the test phase. And we've achieved this happier state of events because we've taken some of the effort in testing and moved it and brought it forward. So if you like, we've taken the green area of the test phase and put it as part of the trusted requirements and stories phase. So if we look at this you know, as a schematic, and as, as I say, it's not to scale, but as a thought process, let's consider the impact of this behavior. What we actually end up with is a longer requirements phase, a shorter development phase, and a shorter test phase. And the test phase essentially becomes um, much less dominated by checking and retesting, because that is done up front by the developers. So it's a shorter phase, and it's also much more focused on the higher levels of testing, the end-to-end -end and exploratory testing. So if we look at how that might affect the overall duration of a piece of work for a single feature, what we see is we have a longer requirements phase because we uh, validate the requirements, because we create stories and scenarios to illustrate or example those requirements feed that to developers who can follow the test-driven development approach so they don't generate buggy code, they fix it as they write it, and the testing is reduced in duration as well. And it's a more compact, also a smarter phase. It's not about lots of uh, uh, simple desk checking tables of test cases. It becomes more exploratory and it becomes more focused and risk-based, if you like. And we save a lot of time. Now, what the numbers are, I don't know, and I can't give you any metrics, except that it's plain to see that if we change our behavior, we redistribute some of the testing upstream, there are savings to be made, and there are improvements of quality to be achieved. So, how do stories and, and scenarios validate requirements? Well, if you like, when an analyst uh, interviews a user and says, uh, you know, tell me uh, what you need from this system. What will tend to happen is a user, well, a user doesn't spout forth perfectly formulated business rules in a coherent manner uh, to be captured and reproduced in a requirements document. They cannot do that. What they tend to do is they tend to tell stories. They describe the, the, the flow of work through their business processes, they describe particular scenarios in sequence, and they give you examples of the system in use as they imagine it. Now, what the analyst then has to do is collect these stories and look for patterns of behavior within the functionality and tease out the business rules and capture those business rules to summarize the behavior of the system as a whole. But the stories generate the requirements and then the requirements can be validated by those stories. Now, what normally happens in most uh, analysts, uh, you know, the requirements uh, phases, the analyst uh, following this process, is the stories get captured in notebooks as handwritten notes, but they're not retained. They are working documents which are not published and not reused. And yet, the value of those stories is incredible because they, they are exact, concrete examples of the system in use. Now what we're trying to suggest with behavior driven development is the requirements and the stories and the stories and the requirements, it's an iterative process. We start with the story, we, re we refine a, de derive a business rule, we validate against the story, the story improves, the requirement improves, it's a circular process. But we can validate requirements by using the stories themselves. They are, if you like, self-correcting. So the principle is that by bringing some test activity up front, the testers ask those awkward questions about, well, what about this case, and what about that situation, and how does the system deal with this uh, uh, condition, and so on. So the, the tester mentality and attitude brings the critical thinking into this process of defining business rules and validating them. So the outcome of that would be a trusted requirement and some concrete examples of the system in use, which can be used by developers to drive their test-driven approach. So I haven't time to talk about this, but in the pocketbook, which I haven't mentioned, but uh, we wrote a pocketbook uh, uh, late last year, Susan uh, Windsor and myself, 
which describes the, this method end to end, but in particular, I think called DefoSpan, which is uh, it's a silly name for uh, a silly mnemonic for an approach to creating business stories from requirements and using them to validate um, validate those requirements to, so they can be trusted. Um, if you Google DefoSpan, you'll you'll track it down. You can download the pocketbook for free, uh, by the way, and the the approach is described in there in full. Now, one question that arises from this is, well, how many scenarios does it take to fully test a feature or to validate a requirement, or how many scenarios do I need to do an estimate as a developer? And there are these six uh, key objectives that we have when we are looking at a requirement and creating stories to align with them and to validate them. Uh, one could say that to understand the scope and to give you give a stakeholder enough information to accept that feature when uh, it's, it's available for testing and to validate the requirement, um, these are slightly different levels or depth, uh, levels of detail in, in scenarios and obviously the more scenarios the more detail, but uh, in principle these happen during iteration planning, so before you commit to uh, uh, delivering a, uh, a feature, this is, these are the questions to ask. Do we have enough scenarios to validate this requirement? Do we trust the requirement? Now, now when the time comes to implement that feature, the developers will require sufficient uh, scenarios to allow them to estimate, to predict when the work will end. Obviously, there's a different number of scenarios, and maybe scenarios that are hidden from uh, system testers and stakeholders for them to do their unit testing, and also the system tests of the feature as well. So these are questions that can only be asked, uh, answered by the team uh, working on the feature itself, but these are the questions to ask as to how much de detail we go to before we uh, decide to implement a feature and during the implementation. So one of the big paybacks beyond uh, the process taking less time and hopefully delivering uh, better quality functionality is that uh, one of the big challenges of testing and software documentation in general is to demonstrate the traceability of uh, a requirement through to a test and back again. So what I want to describe really is, is by following this process end to end, rather than the testers having to retrospectively figure out how to cover all the functionality, that traceability, that coverage is achieved as part of the process because we have made the process into a natural sequence of uh, translations and development activity rather than putting the testing at the end as far away from the definition and requirements as we could. We've brought these two activities together so the traceability is achieved in flight. It's a byproduct, not a big activity in its own right. Now to, to illustrate this, uh, it, it was easier, you know, we've, we've built a, a software product to support you know, the ideas I'm promoting here, but um, it was easier simply to take some screenshots than to draft diagrams and, and, and mock-ups and so on. So I'm going to show you some sections of some pages of a tool uh, just to illustrate the thinking. So firstly, we start from the, the idea of a goal and business ne network. So when a business decides to embark on a business program, uh, involving software, uh, there will be a series of um, intermediate and ultimate goals for them to uh, achieve the business benefit they, they desire. So uh, this picture here is really a, if you read it from bottom up, uh, from the bottom you've got the initial lower level goals and the dependencies and a pathway up to the ultimate uh, business goal which is at the top of the tree. Uh, if you turn it upside down, it would be at the base of the tree. But you get the idea. It's not a tree, it's a network. And there are paths towards the ultimate business goal that we can follow. Some of those paths will involve software, some of them will not. So when businesses embark on software development projects, usually there's a bigger goal in mind than just delivering a new system. Now, part of the goal network is we can associate risks with that goal network. So you can see down here, these octagonal shapes represent uh, the risks, and this risk here, software change affects existing games, this is a lottery game, uh, case study, uh, this risk here, 
affects the central system development and the terminal software development. So a risk can affect multiple goals, and, and that makes sense. That's the nature of uh, the projects that we work on. And you can see the lower level goals, because they have, uh, work has started, some of the risks are now green and some of the uh, goals also are green and amber, they're in progress. Okay, so you can see progress through the goal network. So that's there really just to set the scene for the requirement. And a requirement would be associated with one of the business goals relating to a software system. So we start with a goal, we identify a set of requirements, and this screenshot here just shows some text for a simple calculator, but uh, it doesn't matter what the requirement is. And you see some highlight highlighted uh, words. Something I haven't mentioned is this notion of the language we use in our requirements and stories is part of the, uh, if you like, framework within which we work. The language we use itself, the ubiquitous language, as it's increasingly called, the language that is from the business but finds its way into requirements, into tests, into code itself, we would call that ubiquitous language. So the highlighted words on this page, and you can see this word number appears there, that's got a definition in a dictionary within the tool. So that is highlighted within the requirement, and also, this is an example of a story. So if you imagine the requirement is at the top half of the screen, I scrolled up, this story 94 uh, is a feature called Calculator 2, and you can see there is a story here. So the uh, story is, as a, an older user of the system, I want to perform a calculation, so that's I achieve a numerical result. That's the feature description, and then towards the bottom right is the scenario and some examples of that scenario being executed. So. So far, we've got a requirement and a feature definition, and now some uh, examples of that feature in use. Now, the dictionary can tell us exactly where the words in the index are actually referenced. Uh, so the word number is, for example, referenced in the requirement 196 in the content field. OK. But we have this concept of a hierarchy of requirements, but also the hierarchy leads directly into scenarios. So every scenario represents a test, but it's a test in business language. Okay, so we're not really using the word test, we're using the concept of business scenarios to describe features in use without reference to the software itself. So we can use these scenarios to test or validate the requirements themselves. Now those scenarios, those are in the structured language, this given when then kind of construct, which can feed into the behavior driven development tools that developers are increasingly using in, in agile environments. So we can now describe the test in terms of a business scenario, a feature, a requirement, right the way up to a business goal, and the risks associated with that business goal. So we can report coverage at any of those levels. We can also report coverage using the language itself, this ubiquitous language. So let me just summarize. If we can define our checks as scenarios, story scenarios associated with requirements, we can ask the developers to build the test code to implement those scenarios directly in their environment as checks as part of their unit or feature testing. So the prospect is there for us to fully automate the checking that historically has been done late. Also, because it's automated, those automated tests can be, can be uh, implemented in a continuous integration environment. So we gain the benefit of a continuous feedback on progress through our delivery and also stability of the software that we're working on. So this is another diagram that shows the hierarchy and the feedback loop. So we work from goals, requirements, stories, features, scenarios. We can automatically, we can test these automated, in an automated way or manually if we require and capture that in a log and the log would feed back to scenarios and then we can trace the feedback all the way back to the business goal. So we can provide coverage reports in a whole series of more coherent and understandable ways to stakeholders. It's not about producing huge tabulated lists of bugs and test cases and test runs which have little meaning to our stakeholders. So one uh, final point to make really 
because we have this hierarchy and this network of goals, requirements, stories and tests, we can run it backwards and we can ask the question, suppose we change this feature in some way, suppose we increase the size of a field, we can trace the occurrence of that field throughout our goals, requirements, features and scenarios and tests, so we can report back on the impact of changing such a thing. So rather than uh, concern ourselves with vast quantities of regression testing after the code has been changed, we can do dry runs and suggest actually the number of tests and requirements affected by this change is huge and therefore it would be a bad change to make. And the concept of lean which is increasing popularity is lean starts with choosing the right projects in the first place. The principle is this, projects that fail by and large should never have been started. Okay, so here's the summary. First, agile business analysis and testing become one. We bring definition and assurance together. The requirements and pipeline and the tests are goal and risk based. They are aligned much more closely with the needs of businesses. So we deliver software and we test against goals and business risk to measure achievement. Naturally, some testers will work, be working closer with BAs or may even become a business analyst. Agile governance, which is one of the hot topics for corporates trying to implement Agile, it comes naturally because we get traceability, the way of managing projects through stories and the delivery of stories is much more um, uh, manage manageable, it's much more slick if you like and traceable. With change history and tools that support requirements and stories, we get better governance. So to close, we have an opportunity given the agile thinking and the tools that are emerging to support behavior driven development and some changes in the way we redistribute testing to deliver software faster, of higher quality with good governance. So developers are happier because they have a better definition of the software to be built. They have to take on one of the roles of testing but they are toolsmiths, they are naturally more suited to writing automated testing than later system testers. Testers have the burden of manual checking lifted from them somewhat and they can focus on the more difficult, challenging and intelligent uh, exploration and end-to-end -end testing. The tests derived from specs give rapid feedback about the quality of the code, the level of achievement and the stability of software for all time and the specs are accurate because of that so we don't have dead documents. Automation helps but in principle it's the mindset and the change of thinking that will get us there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that presentation. We'll now open the floor to a few questions. So if you have any questions for Paul, just type them into the questions box, and I'll address them to Paul then. So we'll just kick things off here, Paul, with a question here. And I apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name. Uh, the question here from Amir Kahari. <laughs> and the question is, uh, let me just get my screen up in here. The question here is, BDD works very well for testing stories and component testing, for example, web services, but when considering end-to-end -end scenario testing, BDD gets very messy. What do you suggest when testing scenario-based end-to-end tests? Uh, that's right. I mean, uh, BDD, as it's currently uh, articulated, is really about stories, small, small uh, you know, features that have small scope and a set of concrete examples that can be implemented in an isolated way. So it's great for kind of unit, unit level testing if you like. Um, what we've done is we, and I've not talked about it, but what we've done is part of the method in the pocket book is describes how we use workflows to trace paths through business processes, picking up features and scenarios en route. So in effect we can define a business end-to-end -end test through a process picking up business scenarios and business features, uh, the feature descriptions in business language, but we can also transform those tests, those end-to-end -end procedures if you like, into end-to-end -end test procedures. 
and the automation that sits at the back end to implement BD can also be used to implement uh, end-to-end -end tests with some uh, adjustments, if you like, and the, the existing BDD tools, some of them will do this, uh, others won't, but for example, uh, we're looking right now, we're integrating um, robot framework, which is you know, with Selenium backend to test websites and to run end-to-end uh, -end tests. So uh, the current documentation and books and teaching on BDD does not support, not very well anyway, end-to-end uh, -end testing because that's not its heritage. It's also come pretty much from the development and technical community rather than the business community. End-to-end um, -end testing is something that we, we uh, can see our way, a path to doing it. Some of it can be automated. It's not as easy, of course not. And much of it will remain uh, manual and that's just the nature of end-to-end -end testing. Uh, I didn't describe it today, but uh, we have a yeah, we've, it, it, there's some stuff in the pocketbook. I'm happy to uh, carry on the conversation afterwards to uh, describe it more in more detail. The next question we have here is from a Chuan Lim. What if you have vague requirements? The requirements, the requirements might change over time. Indeed. <laughs> um, well, I think the argument is even stronger. If you have vague requirements, it's the best thing to do to get your developers to write code to spend uh, two or three weeks of their lives writing some software which then when the user sees, the user says, well that's not what I want at all. It's a waste of everybody's time to do it that way. One of the aspects of using uh, uh, feature definitions and scenarios in stories is they act as like a feedback loop. So when we have a, a vague requirement, we can create a, identify say a feature and create some concrete scenarios and feed it back and suggest, well, given this situation, when this happens, this is what we expect to appear on the screen. Is this what you mean, Mr. User? And the user will either say, yes, that's exactly right, or, oh, no, 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 it's much more complicated, or actually, I've missed the point, I've not thought it through, I need to go back and have a more serious think. We can use stories as, if you like, paper prototypes. So although they don't look like prototypes, we can walk through the thought process of using a prototype. Now one aspect which I haven't talked about again is what the opportunity of the structured stories, the, the structured stories give us the opportunity of generating test code, but they could also generate paper prototypes. So you could imagine a piece of code generating some tests, but a piece of code also generating some dummy web pages with some buttons and some text describing the behavior that a user would see. It wouldn't look like the application, but the uh, behavior in business terms could be validated by a user. And something we've um, speculated about is we could give in these given when then scenarios, we could present that to the user, but not give them the actual outcome that's been captured in the story. We could give them either a multiple choice set of answers, uh, you know, given this situation, when, this, when the user does this, then A, B, C, D, one of these things happen. We could give them a test and check that they have an understanding of the requirement. Or we could ask them to type something in to capture what their belief is, because we might not know what the outcome should be. We could use the prototype to capture the requirements in a more concrete way. Now, we've not made much progress on this, but the thinking is, is there and the, the, the opportunity is there to do much smarter testing of requirements using structured stories because, because they're structured, we can use software to interpret and analyze the text and transform it into a test or into a prototype. Okay, the next question I have here for you is from a Torquil Ostad. In regards to production versus going live, how do you avoid customers being exposed to changes in production? Um, we don't, well, uh, there's something as simple as not telling them about it and not making the options visible on screens. And um, there, there's a hundred ways that developers can do this and operations people. You can put it on servers that are not, not exposed to the internet for a start. You could put it on servers which are only exposed to friendly customers who you've had a, uh, a conversation with. You could just expose it to your test team who know how to access the functionality, but um, it's not available to anyone else. In fact, uh, I'm pretty certain companies like Google and Amazon and eBay are releasing software all the time 
without telling their customers and it you know subtle changes appear here there and everywhere and they're not relying on the user community to do the testing for them but rather they they're delivering tested software into production and if the users don't respond well and the feedback is not good they will withdraw it and that's kind of the natural extension of continuous delivery now that's all very well in a in a in an internet business but what about air traffic control software absolutely this is not the way to go um, so don't get me wrong I'm not promising continuous delivery suits every organization or business at all but there is a section of our business community that are moving in that way but in terms of technical ways of uh, delivering software without exposing it to customers uh, probably the best book is the continuous delivery book by Jez Humble and I forget the other author but if you do a search for continuous delivery there's a pretty substantial book on the market now which uh, goes into some of these uh, alternative ways of delivering software safely into production. The capture story in your presentation. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, I only caught a few words of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the question was, what is the tool you use to capture a story in your presentation? Uh, oh, uh, it's on the last slide of the talk. It's called Business Story Manager, and you can find it. I mean, this is the this is the product we're building. I, the the presentation wasn't a pitch to sell the tool. I didn't want to push that too hard. But the tool itself is called Business Story Manager, and if you look for Business Story Manager. Dot com. It, business story manager is one word. Dot com. I, I should say the the website okay. uh, needs bringing up to date a little bit. It's uh, a little bit um, old fashioned looking and needs needs smartening up. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through any more questions, but we will put together all your questions in the form of a blog post, and we will send them out to you as soon as that's ready. And I just want to thank Paul for his presentation today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's attended. And uh, the webinar is now over. Uh, thank you all again. And we hope to see you at another webinar in the future.